So Paul is a, a professor at the University of Minnesota. He has done a, a lot of uh, effort in, in numerical methods, in particular uh, a finite volume with this uh, PPM, which is uh, uh, parabolic piecewise uh, monotonic reconstruction, which uh, I use and many other people use because it's uh, an easy, a cheap way to, to reach high order in, uh, in these schemes. And uh, he has done a lot of work in uh, star um, uh, evolution uh, and with these uh, very high resolution simulations. And he will show us um, um, a new method which has a uh, which is a, a mesh refinement applied to these PPM uh, methods. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, I had these nice pictures on the title slide um, because they're at least in the right geometry. Uh, what I want to tell you about, um, let's see how, ah, what I want to tell you about is a, uh, an effort that I'm involved in now, um, and uh, I'm, I've been taking a, a code that I use to study stars, and uh, you can see sort of a slice through one of the stars uh, that I've computed with this code, and, uh, and I'm adding in uh, AMR to it, and uh, some other features, I'm trying to get it to go uh, on the GPUs. And uh, my thought uh, upon visiting people in Zurich was, gee, there's got to be something else I can do with this code, uh, or someone else could use it for. Um, and so it, it seemed to me that, that disk problems have sort of the same geometry. Uh, at least they're, they're sort of round, <laughs> you know. Uh, stars are spherical, uh, disks are not, well, they're not spherical, uh, but there are a lot of the same issues. Uh, the stars that I've calculated so far um, are, are not, um, they're not rotating, uh, but uh, I, I went to a, a conference at the beginning of the summer and uh, we talked about uh, observations with uh, uh, astro seismology of stars of this type, and uh, they claim, gee, they're rotating. And uh, so I'm clearly going to have to uh, incorporate that uh, into, this, into this code. Uh, this is just a, a, a time series from one of the calculations uh, that I've done. Uh, but just to, to show you that uh, I'm using a Cartesian grid, um, and uh, Clement told you about uh, a polar coordinate grid, and, uh, and I want to convince you that uh, a Cartesian grid uh, works fine, uh, even for round objects. And so uh, this is uh, the interior of a star. Uh, you can see at the early time, which is at the upper left, uh, that is really nice and round. Uh, it becomes not so nice and round at the end, uh, but that's because uh, it's had this very violent uh, outburst. And so what I'd like to, to do is uh, to convince you that, that this code that I'm building will be uh, special and uh, will have some uh, good properties for doing this disk problems. And, and so <clears throat> I'm introducing uh, AMR and uh, I'm doing it uh, with only three levels. <laughs> and so part of the argument is that three levels is enough. And, and so I've been talking to a number of people uh, uh, during the conference who have lots more levels and I've been trying to convince them, well, with maybe not so much success, uh, that three is enough, but I want to give you my arguments for uh, why I am doing that. And, and so it's nice that you've seen uh, the very nice results from the previous speaker who has only one level. And so, gee, imagine, you know, what I could do with three. <laughs> uh, and, and so these are just some examples of uh, what I could do if I wanted to uh, uh, compute the formation of a planet within the disk, uh, then I could use my extra levels uh, to refine around the planet. Um, and of course, I, I could 
have lots of levels right near the planet, uh, but my thought is that the formation problem probably does not depend terribly much on the details of what's going on in the atmosphere of this planet. And so uh, just having uh, three levels will be good enough, but I would only expend one of them to uh, get a, a better description near the planet uh, because I'd use one of the other ones uh, to handle the boundary condition. Uh, that basically uh, I could de-refine and, uh, and, and go out to a larger radius uh, at lower cost. And, and this is the reason why I'm introducing AMR uh, for the stellar problems, which I've been computing so far uh, with uniform grids uh, with some success. Uh, but I find that G uh, things happen as they did at the end of the sequence I showed just a, a moment ago and uh, I would like to give this thing some more room uh, to do whatever it wants um, you know after you know it has one of these outbursts. Uh, so one of the issues uh, that comes up uh, when one has a rotating system is uh, angular momentum and angular momentum transport. And so that's one of the, uh, the issues that I've discussed with uh, the people at Zurich who are, are doing this work. And uh, I wrote a code uh, about 20 years ago uh, in 2D to do disk galaxies. And I used, uh, I used polar coordinates and uh, we did the calculation, it was for uh, the conditions of the galaxy M81, and we found that a, a strong spiral wave uh, developed, uh, because of course this is a self-gravitating disk, and uh, that there was tremendous amount of angular momentum transport that uh, was caused by the presence of this spiral wave. And uh, my conclusion after that was that we had put so much effort into uh, being in the uh, rotating coordinate system and in polar coordinates, um, and then we found after we got the answer uh, that we didn't need it. And uh, so I'm just sort of uh, guessing that maybe I'm not really going to need it uh, for the planet formation problem. And the idea is that there will be one special rotating frame of reference, uh, which would be the frame of reference that is rotating with the forming planet, and uh, that it would set up uh, a spiral wave, uh, and that spiral wave would have a, a pattern speed, that is, it would be a fixed pattern rotating as sort of a solid body, the pattern that is, uh, at that same rate. So that would be the special rotating frame, and uh, I can do that. Uh, I would do the calculation uh, in Cartesian coordinates in the rotating frame, and, uh, and, and I believe that under those circumstances, uh, given that uh, I'd be using a high order uh, numerical method that I'd be okay uh, without having the, um, the, the um, polar coordinate system. And it's partly a question of how many times does one have to follow this thing going around. Um, and, and I'm thinking that, uh, that the formation would happen uh, relatively rapidly under these conditions. Um, and that I wouldn't have to follow it for more than, say, uh, a dozen rotations. Uh, for the case of M81, when we did it in 2D uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was sort of three rotations, and, and then it's not M81 anymore. And so clearly, um, you know, uh, we had left something out of the true M81, and that was our conclusion after doing that work. Uh, so what I've said here is that, uh, that the polar coordinates, I think, really are best if there is a very small amount of 
angular momentum transport, and uh, one does is, you know, 60 rotations, and uh, there's just a little bit of radial movement, uh, but I, I'm just sort of guessing that, and, or hoping, you can say, <laughs> that uh, if there isn't very much angular momentum transport, well, then maybe uh, there wouldn't be a planet either. Uh, but anyway, that, that's the view uh, that I'm taking. And, and the reason uh, that I want to use Cartesian coordinates uh, and that I do use them for spherical stars is that uh, it is much easier to design uh, a really effective numerical method in Cartesian coordinates. And, uh, and they are just uh, ideal in terms of uh, doing the domain decomposition uh, and everything else. So uh, the kind of AMR that I uh, am, am implementing uh, is illustrated here. Uh, uh, this picture was made by uh, a collaborator, William Dye, uh, who built, uh, who has an AMR code of a different type, and, uh, and I've convinced him that this particular type that I uh, want to uh, describe to you is, is uh, going to be really good, so he modified uh, his grid generator to show what these kinds of grids would look like. And I'm calling it briquette by briquette AMR. Uh, you can see in this illustration uh, that there are little uh, uh, cubicle chunks, uh, and each one has uh, four by four by four grid cells. Uh, this kind of chunk of uh, 64 cells uh, is, in my opinion, uh, the smallest uh, uniform grid cubicle chunk uh, that you can pick that uh, the present uh, hardware will update uh, really effectively. And uh, that's because of the SIMD engines in all of the CPUs and GPUs uh, that we have today, and uh, their preference for uh, fixed length uh, vectors uh, of 16 or 32 uh, uh, words. And uh, I don't know, I talked to a gentleman from NVIDIA and he said I'd better be ready for 64. And uh, with these chunks of 64 cells, well, I could do 64, but uh, I hope they don't go to 128. Uh, the, the basic idea is that the hardware is built uh, to process things that have a uniformity. And uh, so uh, with this kind of AMR, uh, I've, I sort of guarantee that uniformity uh, so that if I process these uh, briquettes, uh, then I will always uh, be able to process them uh, very uh, efficiently. And so uh, I, I've uh, planned to do this on three grid levels, and one of the reasons for that uh, is scalability. And so I haven't, uh, I've mentioned here that uh, my planning is that for the stars that I'm doing, uh, and a particular uh, problem that I've targeted of uh, the merger of two convection shells above uh, different burning shells in a star. Um, I, I, can, I can envisage doing that well uh, with about two million grid bricks, uh, each big enough uh, so that they can be efficiently updated uh, with uh, a single node on the machines that are being built today. Uh, and that would require bricks, which on their finest grid uh, would have either 96 uh, or 192 cells on a side. Um, and it turns out that uh, exactly which, um, that sort of a range, and exactly uh, how big you decide to make these bricks uh, pretty much depends upon uh, how many threads you have on that node, uh, how much uh, stuff you had to keep busy. Um, I was talking to the NVIDIA uh, person, Peter Mesmer, yesterday, and with the Pascal uh, GPU, uh, the 96 cubed cells is uh, not really quite big enough. Uh, 
to keep one GPU absolutely you know, going full out, and uh, I'd probably go to the larger size. Uh, but with two million bricks like that, um, uh, with the scheme that I'll describe in a minute, uh, I, I believe I can scale that uh, to 20,000 nodes. Uh, over the last year, I've had conversations with uh, a number of people who are doing AMR uh, and uh, trying to scale it. And uh, scaling over, you know, the largest uh, scaling limit that uh, I've encountered by talking to people is about 4,000 nodes. And I think I can push this uh, about another factor of five. Uh, so, I want to uh, argue, well, how can it be that three levels is enough? And of course, it's a problem-dependent statement. Uh, but one thing that uh, I, I, I have uh, discussed with people at, at the conference uh, yesterday is that I am not doing cosmology, as so many other people are. Uh, and uh, if I were doing cosmology, uh, then I might have to uh, have a protoplanetary disk or a uh, galactic disk somewhere that is somewhat resolved, and then I'd have another one way over there. And I'd have to get my grid all the way over there, uh, you know, to describe that one also. And so I am limiting my attention to the kind of problem um, that I'm doing with stars where I, I look at one star. I haven't got two, I haven't got uh, 10,000. Uh, and here I'm thinking I would look at one protoplanetary disk. And in that case, I think uh, that it would be efficient. Uh, if you imagine how would I use more grid levels uh, that I can argue that, well, I ought to be able to get the problem done uh, with just three uh, and do it equally accurately and at the same or less time. And the reason for that is that uh, with these grid levels, I will uh, also have different time steps. And as a result, the uh, ratio of how much work there is to do in a single chunk of the grid, and I do have uh, uh, cubicle chunks that are assigned to nodes, and uh, they are the same physical size, uh, but they have uh, very different numbers of grid cells in them. And the biggest ratio of the amount of work in one chunk or another uh, is then 256, uh, which is a really big number. And what it means is that on the Corsus grid, uh, updating one of those chunks costs me essentially nothing. It's almost nothing compared to updating uh, one of the chunks that is fully refined and uh, that is sitting in some part of the problem that I really care about. And so my thought is that I can have lots and lots uh, of these other chunks uh, that cost almost nothing and, uh, and, and it will not involve a lot of work. Uh, if I introduce, say, a fourth grid level, and so I could uh, get rid of some of them, uh, my thought is, well, so what? Uh, they're not really costing me that much, and so I would not bother. Uh, you know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter, I claim, and uh, that, of course, is a, a problem-dependent uh, uh, thing. Uh, but. The advantage that I get from three grid levels is that I can contain uh, for equal size bricks uh, the difference in computational load uh, down to a factor of 256. And I'm thinking that on any node, uh, I would have at least that many threads. If it's a, uh, a nice landing accelerated node, I'd have 272 threads. Uh, if it's a Pascal accelerated node, I'd have 464 threads. Uh, and so I got lots of threads. And uh, a node that would have, say, 256 of these insignificant, you know, uh, coarse grid bricks uh, could just throw one thread at each one. Uh, update them uh, very efficiently, 
uh, and get them all done in the same time uh, that another node that had just one fully refined um, you know, uh, grid brick could use all of its threads uh, together and get that done. So I get an advantage with the three grid levels of being able to have all of my bricks have the same physical size. And that means that they all have precisely 26 neighbors uh, and my messaging is uh, relatively simple. And uh, I can uh, just update the brick and send off all the messages uh, and, uh, and then go on to uh, another brick. And uh, that is a great simplification of the MPI. Uh, and, and so that is very helpful. Uh, Let's see, I have got here, I, I, and one of these I, I worked out, um, oh, okay, so um, I want to explain how I can keep everything going. And the way that I, I can keep everything going is uh, I use the uh, self-scheduled uh, thread assignment of tasks. Um, a task might be uh, the update of a very coarse grid block, uh, or it might be just the update of a what I call a grid pencil, which is a strip of these uh, briquettes. Uh, and I would just keep uh, all of the threads doing that. Um, I would have a master thread on each node that does MPI, uh, but otherwise everybody uh, is always busy. And um, Let's see, I wanted to get to this other, I want to get to this, hmm. <laughs> this picture. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a picture that illustrates how uh, I plan to do uh, dynamic load balancing and overlapping of the messaging uh, with the updates of, the, of these grid bricks. And uh, the picture here is showing you um, a lot of the 26 messages that I have to send. And uh, you're to imagine that I have a bunch of bricks like this that are all lined up on the plane of symmetry uh, for this disk. And you can think of the, all the bricks above and all the bricks below as two different populations. And what I'm going to do is sort of a red-black type algorithm where uh, I update all the guys uh, who are above the disk, for example, first. And uh, then I do all the ones below. And while I'm doing that, all the messages are getting to their destinations. Um, and uh, the people above the disk all depend on the receipt of messages from other guys that are above the disk. Everyone who is below depends on receipt of messages from people below. Uh, there's only one problematical uh, place, and that is right at the plane of symmetry. And because it is a plane of symmetry, uh, I would expect that these two populations would involve about equal amounts of work. And so the idea is that I would deal out uh, these bricks to the participating nodes uh, so that everybody gets about an equal amount, and it, it doesn't have to be exact or precise, uh, uh, but about an equal amount of work uh, from each population. And uh, the minimum amount that uh, any node could have uh, would be two fully, fully refined brick equivalents, uh, one above and one below. And there is one set of bricks that have faces like this sort of far left face that is shown here that is along the dividing line. And uh, there are a set of messages, only one set, uh, from below or above, but not both, uh, that more or less have to move instantly. Uh, from the one population to the other in order to allow this update back and forth to work. And so uh, the idea is that since everybody has to have bricks uh, both above and below, uh, I would deal them out in such a way uh, that a node that has one of these special bricks will have the other one that matches it so that it can send its largest message, the face message, uh, immediately over in no time, because it's on the same node. 
Uh, but these other uh, eight messages, which are much smaller, uh, would somehow have to get there uh, in a very short uh, amount of time. And so the trick is to divide this brick up into uh, one uh, plane of briquettes uh, that is up against the, uh, de the cleavage plane uh, and to update that completely first and then finish the update. And uh, to do that and get those messages off so that they will have time to arrive uh, takes about 5% more time. Uh, and so that would be a cost. Uh, I would have to give about 2.1 uh, times the amount of work for a fully refined uh, grid break to each node. But that allows me to do this scaling. Uh, and I had an example here worked out. Uh, I'm not sure which of these many slides it is. <laughs> uh, but it had about, for a disk uh, with the coarse uh, resolution uh, being 3,000 cells across, um, it came out to about half a million grid bricks uh, with a, a vast number of them on the coarsest level. Uh, and my thought is that for dynamic load balancing, what I would do is I'd move preferentially these coarse little guys uh, around because I could very easily uh, give you a little bit more work to do if you needed just a little more because I'm handing it out in increments of 1 to 56th. Okay, so that I can get very even uh, adjustments. And the idea is that uh, I would have no concern that the numerous bricks that might exist on one particular node, uh, that they communicate preferentially with each other uh, because uh, I can see how much bandwidth I need uh, to do this. And, uh, you know, to completely ignore that, and as I put in the numbers for dual Haswell nodes, uh, I would need about a little less than one gigabyte per second uh, interconnect bandwidth over uh, the whole machine. And uh, machines that are being built today uh, have specs that are considerably better than that. Uh, uh, but uh, there have also been uh, real experiments done at uh, NERSC in Berkeley uh, that, th that show that they actually deliver better than one gigabyte per second, uh, so it should work. And this is just sort of a diagram here showing those little messages that have to get you know, uh, quickly over. Uh, and, uh, and I hope I've convinced you uh, that I could do all that. So uh, this coding effort is underway. Uh, and, um, well, hopefully uh, it'll be done uh, very soon. I had hoped it to be done now and, well, that I'm just a very optimistic person. Uh, but uh, it should be done soon. And so I should stop and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, we can thank you. Thank you, Paul. So, if you have any questions, yes, Hubert. Thank you. Very interesting work. So, the distance between Jupiter's core and, let's say, the Hill sphere, so this means a factor of a thousand. So, do you think you can cover this entire range by just level, three levels, or would you then not have to go to, to a different, uh, to, to more levels? And would this have to change your method? Uh, as, as I said, I've, I've talked to a number of people, and, and you know, uh, during the, you know, the uh, event at the restaurant on the first night, uh, we really got into sort of jokes about three levels. Uh, and I could add more levels. <laughs> I, I thought about that. Uh, what I would not, uh, the easy way to add more levels uh, is to break this uh, design that I have where every brick has the same physical volume. Um, I, I could have, uh, I would like to keep the constraint 
that there are only three levels inside any given if they brick. All appeared in one and brick, the idea is you would that just if you fill in had, the say, coarser four, ones with finer levels. ones, yeah. uh, and the cost of that uh, would be very minimal. It's just one brick. Uh, I think the argument for having more levels uh, is to get a larger uh, dynamic range and uh, to get costs down uh, for these regions you have to bridge uh, to get to another region of interest. And um, so I think if you were trying to form, say, multiple planets in, in one disk uh, and you wanted more levels, uh, that would be a reason for it. Uh, if, if I broke the assumption that all of the bricks are the same size, uh, then I would introduce ones that are precisely half uh, the linear size in order to sort of contain how complicated the MPI messaging is. Uh, I, I have friends, uh, in fact, my collaborator, William Dye, has a, a load balancing technique where uh, he does a recursive bisection so that each of his uh, bricks updated by a node uh, is a rectangular solid, but they don't fit together uh, in reasonable ways, and he may need to talk to hundreds of other guys uh, from each one. Uh, and I just wanted to avoid that complexity uh, because life is difficult enough. Uh, but if, if, if you kept this regularity, uh, it would be possible then to say, well, maybe on this face uh, I have four bricks over there instead of one, and that would just be another level uh, of complexity in the code. And I might be ready for that next year. <laughs> <laughs> so that Okay. But I think there are a lot of problems that one could address very profitably with just three levels. <laughs>